In 1997, Red Dwarf was remastered. Digitally enhanced picture and sound were combined with updated CGI effects to polish up the first three series, now almost a decade old. This new glossy dwarf was designed to make the program appealing to a new generation of fans, particularly in the important overseas market, where the remastered episodes would seem less dated and more likely to attract the attention of program buyers. How would the new shows take shape? What could be done on a budget that would have been considered generous if remastering in the 17th century? And what would the existing fan base make of it all? This is the story of that launch. The reasons for remastering mainly were embarrassment. We took out a lot of the uh, UK references in gags that were very dated to that time. It was possible to do things that we weren't able to do the first time around. We might have wanted to do a lot the first time around, but the technology constrained us. The people who worked for the BBC who were selling Red Wolf said basically, we can't sell it, no one. Although the later series uh, are fine, the first two series are just so god-awful, we can't sell it to anyone. And I said, would it help if they were remastered and we got a whole new look? And they went, oh, well, if you could do that, problem solved. Then we will be able to take them to Japan and blah, 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 and sell them. So with my constant one eye on the film, I thought, well, if we can crack Japan, huge territory, that's definitely the way to go. Doug Naylor and Ed By revisited the episodes one by one and made copious notes of what might be improved. Everything was on offer. Editing tweaks, sound and picture improvements, effects upgrades, continuity fixes, the lot. As I went through it, my notes became longer and longer and longer and I realised that there's so much we can do, we could do, that to improve the shows. There is a use of the word remastering to mean that this will be the original show or music or whatever they're talking about but polished up in the same way as people get scratches off old vinyl recordings the other approach is you could say well let's not do that let's revisit the thing and let's just actually forget what we did the first time around and approach the thing in a completely new way let's wipe the slate clean and see what we can do now to make a virtue of making the shows a different take on each episode pacing of shows change you know, what you used to do 20 years ago or 15 years ago, pace-wise of a show now, would, could look tediously long. The original shows will always be there. This is something else, and it, this is working for, you know, other markets outside of the UK. And hey, if UK Red War fans want to watch them and enjoy them, great. But it's not a replacement. In the same way that, you know, George Martin's taken Beatle tracks and done different versions of them. Now, you may love them, you may not, but you know, they haven't, it hasn't erased time and we haven't lost the original Beatles tracks. Correcting mistakes and doing what couldn't be done before were high on the team's agenda, typified by the chance to reshoot and revamp the ambitious opening shot of the show. And we did what we always wanted to do, which is the big pull-out. And of course we had the sophisticated technology then to be able to pull it off. The team's experiences with Series 7 had also shown how significantly picture quality could be improved in post-production. One inch videotape is not digital. So every time you wanted to create another version of the show, it was dropped down to another piece of tape. And every time it dropped down to another piece of tape, you lose more and more quality. So by the time you had the finished product, it was a bit gray. With sophisticated grading machines, Pogol and so forth, you took the original transmission tape, I stuck it into a grade and we tweaked up the saturation and tweaked up the chroma and suddenly, boof, this thing came to life. Grading could pull the best, brightest picture quality from the original tapes, on top of which a film effect was added. We applied it to the remaster to give it an overall look, to consolidate the looks, because series one and two and three obviously are different. If you're packaging them together, you want to have something that gives it an overall... Uh, uh, to try and link them all together in some form, and film effects seem to be the way to do it. What film and a film look gives you is a glossier more heroic Hollywood look, if you like. But in fact, what it was doing was distancing them, kind of placing this gloss between the audience and what they'd seen originally. Not the picture was the only area for obvious enhancement. New sound editor Jem Whippy was given the opportunity to go more cinematic, 
though getting started wasn't easy. To get the original sound back from the multitracks was a bizarre feat of um, technical expertise, dealing with ancient old tape, old multi multi uh, track machines that never haven't been fired up for you know five years. Technicians from the BBC who we had to pull out of retirement and try and get this stuff so we could get the original soundtracks back. We put the first tape on. I thought, great, the wheels are going around, the sound coming out of this thing is fantastic. What I'll do is I'll just play them through and I'll take all the sound off those and I'll put them onto the computer. Why are you always asking him? I'll do it. About three minutes into this process, the sound starts to fade away and starts to become very like this and you can't hear anything that's going on. So like, hang on, stop everything. So we go back to the machine and look at the, the playhead on this machine. The sound runs across a head which picks up the sound for it. And the trouble is that the, all the oxide and chemicals and magnetic coating on this tape was starting to come off because the tapes were so old. So to play a couple of minutes till it drifted off, stop, clean all the machines down again, run back 10 seconds, do another three, four. We might get, you know, eight minutes if we were lucky or what have you. We had to go through all these tapes and do this thing. And then, of course, you've got files which are non-sync. So you've got to edit all these elements back together again. Separated audio tracks also allowed the cast dialogue to be stripped out. For the first time, the early series could be made available for dubbing overseas. The new stereo mix provided cleaner dialogue tracks and a richer overall soundtrack, with sound effects for everything. The team were also able to use library music to enhance parts of the show that might have benefited from more dramatic scoring. Lister's predicted death in future echoes now seemed a lot more imminent. Three. Two. The idea, as I said, was to try and make the show a little bit more cinematic from start to finish, and also try and add maybe a bit more mood, a bit more emotion, more shape to the show as a viewer for you to watch. Music can alter what you think you're seeing. You, you have, you know, grey set, grey walls, everything's slightly kind of plasticky, and then you get a big orchestral piece on it, and suddenly you think, no, what I'm seeing is actually, you know, amazing. But it was in the area of model effects that the remastered made its biggest changes. Never entirely happy with the original Red Dwarf model, Doug and Ed called in the BBC effects team to come up with something new. Rob and I had no input into Red Dwarf. We expected it to be a big, horrible, you know, ironmongery type mining ship, but we didn't expect it to be in a big, massive block. In terms of it being a kind of a tanker, they're going to be built in components and the components would be added to one another. So logically, it's much more likely to be a pencil shape than it is to be, you know, this shape. The overall design feel was um, eventually a drawing that Alan Brannan had done. But when Doug and Ed saw it, they, they liked the overall feel, but they wanted it longer. So Alan took that drawing he'd done, photocopied it, then cut out the middle, extended the two ends, and represented it. And they said, no, longer. And we did it again, and it was no longer, and did it again. So in the end, the, that's why there's two asteroid bays on the new Red Dwarf, because it started to look a little bit front-heavy or back-heavy. So a little bit of symmetry was brought back into it. So we made a new Red Dwarf, which went from ostensibly that size to way, way past the edges of this shot. And um, it was huge. And it was built as a model, huge, and it was very, very long. Um, I can't remember quite how long, but um, certainly enough to kill a small dog. The original ship was, I think it was about eight feet long, and the new one was 12 and a half feet. Just as a piece of modeling, it was light years beyond the original one, which was kind of hurled together very, very quickly. The intention with uh, the new Red Wolf uh, model was to shoot the miniature, not the CGI version. The CGI was going to be reserved for uh, walking blue midgets and stuff that you, you, you couldn't do motion controlled. It then turns out that the uh, hugely long pencil 
uh, couldn't be filmed in the BBC's studios because as it was so large, the motion control camera couldn't get the required distance away from the miniature to do proper beauty passes. So we then couldn't go that route. And any other studio was going to be more expensive. So we were completely stymied. So stuff that had been, we'd expected to do miniature-wise, we now couldn't do. Uh, and equally, they et into the CGI budget that had been reserved. So it was a kind of double whammy. BBC visual effects were on the cusp of their own CG, but it wasn't quite as um, sophisticated, for want of a better word, or cheap as um, Chris Veal was, who was operating at that time out of his mum's house. Chris Veal had proved himself with Series 7 Extended, providing high-quality computer models that impressed Doug and Ed enough to entrust the job to him. The process really, for me, was to use the models as reference for building uh, computer-generated versions uh, and to use the texture maps that they had on the existing ships to build up some new versions in the computer. Uh, and as much detail as was possible was built onto the CG model. But there was one sequence, the famous closing titles, that the FX team did shoot for real. I was called into the edit suite and Ed and Doug were looking at a model sequence which had been shot uh, of the Red Dwarf physical model and it was actually a motion control shot where the camera sort of flew up over the ship. And unfortunately, it had been shot against a black screen without any stars, and they were trying to composite in some stars afterwards. But due to the nature of the motion control, which actually kind of tilted as it went up over the model, the stars didn't look like they were in the same place. And I think this was really before there was any kind of motion tracking uh, software available readily. So the decision really came to try and do a computer-generated version of it. That was quite a challenge, I have to say, because it's a fairly long sequence. It's a 50-second sequence, or just a bit longer. And it's, it's actually quite close to the model, and it fills the frame quite a lot. So it actually took about seven or eight days, I think, purely to render. And it was rendering away on, I think, two or three machines. Sitting in the corner of my, my little room, I mean, it, wasn't, it certainly wasn't a render farm. It was kind of more like a render allotment. Away from lengthy render times, only one other live-action shot of the redesigned ship has been filmed to date. This previously unseen test for the Red Dwarf movie. Back in the computer realm, Red Dwarf was soon joined by Blue Midget. Another BBC redesign, this was a chance to create something more iconic, something that walked. Blue Midget was always slightly, to me, a bit like a bread van. And we thought maybe we can improve that a bit. It had legs and a ball at the front and two engines at the back. Alan worked that up into a far more detailed rendering. Again, did computer renderings, got those signed off by the production, and then launched into the model. But fully articulated, all lights up, legs work, everything, only ever used as the basis for the CG model, never actually filmed as a miniature. A memorable new design staggered Blue Midget in a fresh direction, part of an unexpectedly heavy CGI workload that made achieving photo reality even tougher than normal. When you deal with a real world with a real model, there is a credibility you immediately get and you're constantly fighting the CGI. Now when the CGI works, you can do much more with it in the computer, manipulate it much more, do all sorts in terms of movement, but it's a very difficult place to get to. Beyond staggering spaceships, by 1997, even the tricks available to a standard edit suite had come on significantly. Editor Mark Wyborn was able to add things that could never have been done easily or cheaply before. The windows outside the quarters just had a couple of little lights stuck on a black piece of cloth. So what we could do then, which we could do much more now, but then was draw around the windows and then we had some star fields, basically just slid them behind. It's not there all the time because the camera moved around, you know, as people moved around, it was very difficult then for us to make it look like it was really there then. So most of the time I did it, as soon as the camera got stopped and stationary didn't move, I sort of shoved some in. Back in reality, reshoots were scheduled to replace footage that really annoyed the makers. Norman Lovett was pulled in to recreate his original Holly performance, though there was a little something missing. I had to go back and do it, and I had to wear this wig because <laughs> my hair all went, and I had some hair when I first did it, and they put this wig on, and I just thought, oh, my God, you know, I just thought, please. 
the funniest thing was trying to make him look as bad as he did in the other shows, really, with being pixelated and everything else and soloized, purely because that was done on a piece of equipment we didn't have anymore. So it was an Ed thing that Ed wanted to, to redo. I think he was not satisfied with Norman's look. The pixelation changed from show to show, the way he came on and off. Um, and I think he thought it would be quite easy to get Norman in, get him to redo the lines, make it all look consistent, then dro just drop it in and off you go. I thought I could navigate at light speed, but I just can't wrap my head round it. Gordon Bennett, that was a close one. And then for the most part, when it was dropped in, there was, it didn't really quite fit. Norm's performance really wasn't as vibrant as it had been in front of the audience. In the end, a significant amount of Lovett's reshoot material went unused, as did attempts to remake Quig's classic chess scene. More successful was the no expense spared solution to an animated rimmer ejection. An available corridor set was also employed to extend a moment on the episode Polymorph. Not all the additional shooting was so sophisticated, however. Episode one, if you watch the funeral sequence, you will see that there are some people in the foreground who were never originally there. This was a very late reshoot, which Doug came up with while we were in the edit. And we the only way we could do it was on a caption camera. A caption camera is a camera that basically looks down on a flat piece of paper and you put paper underneath it and you film it and it goes onto the tape. So we couldn't get this thing out, it was just there. So each person, myself, Doug, Mark Wyborn, the editor, and the assistant editor, Dave, stuck our heads underneath the caption camera and we took a shot of it. Far from being the full revamp the team had intended, the limits of the budget meant that a true reinvention was never possible. Some Rush's footage was retrieved, but for the most part the edit stuck to tightening the episodes as they already existed. Many of the model shots had to be provided on blue or green screen, and sometimes the chance to tinker maybe went too far. It seems nobody wants to own up for these two whizzing scutters. There's two mysterious scutters that appear in episode one. They were put in there by God. It's a mystery how they got there. I have to be completely frank and say, I can't even remember ever seeing that shot ever before in my life. So I have no idea how, where, what that came about. My recollection is that we might have reshot them, but I think that Chris Veal made them. I'm not guilty to that one, I don't know. I was, I was trying to look at the tape the other day, trying to find the uh, CG scutters, supposed uh, CG scutters, um, and I'm... 99% certain it wasn't me. As it turns out, they're not CGI. Unearthed footage reveals that Ed was right the first time. Full-size scutters laid on with blue screen. Oh yeah, I remember that. That was, that was definitely my fault. Now whether you think that was funny or not, I just thought it was kind of interesting at the time. But back to the old thing of once you've fallen in love with something and you really like it, you don't want it to see it changed. The remastered episodes were previewed on BBC Two in time for the show's 10th anniversary. And while the episodes helped the franchise enormously overseas, where the new look made it more appealing and the new soundtrack allowed for much easier dubbing, back home the fans were less than happy. Although commissioned to remaster series four and five, Grant Naylor took the decision to shelve the project until technology caught up with their ambition. No further remastered episodes were made, though the new ships would be used for series eight. And for me, as a viewer, watching the remastered, I'm going, oh, I'm sure we can do better than that. We can, but we couldn't then. Now we could do even more. It's tempting to remaster the remastered. Maybe that's next. I think they sort of stand up a little better now against the rest of the series. I think certainly with more time uh, and no doubt money, we could have achieved more. Um, I think it was an incredibly ambitious project, actually, to do three series worth of replacing model effects at the time we had. I have to admit, looking back on it now, there is a real tinge of uh, disappointment with, with, with the outcome. I think, although I can see um, the BBC reasons for wanting to do it, we should probably have resisted them from a creative point of view because the technology just wasn't there and it didn't turn out, uh, certainly in the way that I had envisaged. But because of the remastering, 
uh, that we did, we then sold it to Japan and South America and various other countries. In terms of the finance of that, brought to the cast and uh, the writers, it was like two grains of rice, but that wasn't important. What was important was the show is now on Japanese television. This is great. Um, this is all going to help the film. Do all the fans like it as much as um, the original series? I think there's an argument to say a lot of them don't. But to be fair, they did have a huge amount of fun and debate ripping it to shreds, so it wasn't completely a waste of time. Action! Fall off! Cut. Save the reds. One of them. <laughs> it's not as good. <laughs> moving on. Yeah, moving on. Okay, Ricardo. You're a bit of a slob, Lister, you know, but. When it comes down to it, you keep your word. This time I'm gonna believe you. Let's go for another drink. Super. <laughs> <laughs> Now to the extended version of the Munchkin song, a symphonic masterpiece which I think in time is going to be up there. Up there in your loft, along with all your other unwanted junk. Wait, I've got something. I'm punching it up. It's too small for a vessel, maybe some kind of missile. It's impossible to tell at this range. Whatever it is, they clearly have a technology way in advance of our own. So the Albanian State Washing Machine Company. <laughs> Step up to red alert. Uh, sir, are you absolutely sure? It does mean changing the bulb. <laughs> 